Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, I think your new thing's trying to make me laugh on this intro. You're getting <laughs> and you're getting me too. Yep, yep, yep. I, I, that look, I know I can give you that look. I know you're trying to hold it back, so I, I love uh, I love doing it. So I'm just <laughs> I'm just afraid one day you're gonna make me start doing the intro and you're gonna get me back hard for that. So yeah, and we're not adding it either. Let this thing ride. Yes, yes. Or, or we need more bloopers, if anything. So maybe we, we, we start adding it using the bloopers. But yeah, no, I, I want to bring up uh, today in our little banner we do just about uh, closing costs. I know we've talked about this. We have uh, a resource to reference to. But you know, right now I'm working on a deal, um, a million dollar deal. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, the buyer can calculate his, uh, what he's got to bring for the down payment. But he's bringing another $30,000 to the closing table based on uh, uh, closing costs and escrows and, and, and tax prorations and, and so forth. So I, I know you wrote something on that. Share kind of what you're thinking. Yeah, this has come up a few times as well, um, both on the buy and sell side where I've been helping people. So one, it's a great resource we put together, right? Because it, it kind of breaks down general costs for your third party stuff, your title. But then there's things within the city of Chicago. You have the, the city, the municipality ones, which you can calculate based off what the sale price is. But then the ones that I think get people are when they're going to buy, so you're on the purchasing side, you're receiving those t- the tax prorations and you're receiving the rent prorations. So it can actually work in your favor a little bit. Your closing costs can almost be washed out. You paid closing costs, right? Because you need that escrow for later. Um, and then on the sell side, it works against you. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's It's... People are like, we had one where a guy overshot it by like 25K or something silly recently because your lender will give you one. I guess my, my the takeaway I would get in all this rambling is your lender gives you one like three or four days in advance. It usually doesn't have everything. It might not have the municipality stuff. It might not have the prorations. Like that number is going to be wrong. So don't go to the bank and wire that. Like there's always, there's, I would get with either if your agent knows what he's doing or your attorney knows what he or she's doing, like I would get with them. Yeah, and the one other thing to add about that, that that's different by every city. So Chicago has it where yeah. both buyer and seller pay them, but all the suburbs are different. Now, most suburbs have it where the, the seller is the one that gets, uh, I say, jammed for those stamp, the transfer stamps. But uh, uh, there's many cities, like I know Addison, is, is the buyer pays for them. So I, I think we can reference that. We have a, uh, something for that as well, too, that breaks out every suburb of who pays what and what the percentage is. Yeah. I mean, it's thousands of dollars exchanging hands, right? Like you should you should know this stuff or check if you know if you can pay the, t- the same title fee twice or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. So, what do we got for the uh, housing provider tip of the week? Housing provider tip of the week. Uh, whether you have one unit or you have uh, thousands, I think the expectation that something is going to go wrong when someone goes to move into your property has to be there, so you have the mental awareness to re- be able to react quickly. I think for our process for a tenant moving in, you know, we're, we're trying to give them all the information up front, hoping they read everything, hoping they click on the couple of links we have uh, and hoping they set up everything on their end that we told them to set up. And then they move in and, you know, we're expecting the unit to be perfect because we, we, we did our, our, our work. We did our QC, we did our leasing final walkthrough. And then we just are always ready for like, all right, what if type stuff, you know, some of that what if type stuff ends up being, all right, the house has been vacant for, for, for two months and, and, and no one knew about this now that it's now that someone moved in actually ran the water it became, for more than five minutes, it's an issue. Or the one issue we used to run into with uh, you know, properties we buy was when no one ran the, the water on a vacant house for two or three years, it was vacant and abandoned. Now all of a sudden you have someone that comes in and, and runs a, a bath, like now that sewer's backing up or there's stuff that, that sat in that pipe. Especially in the city of Chicago, the water backs from the, the street into your pipes that leads your house. And if you're not pushing water out, sometimes that stuff just builds up in your pipe over if it's sitting there empty for a couple of years. Now, when you're working on it, you might have some trickle going on. You might have some water going down. It goes slow. Your contract doesn't tell you. But if, when that tenant moves in, that'll be your first work order. Uh, of the, the t- It goes down slow. So going on a rant here, but ultimately um, to be a better uh, housing provider, just be ready for something goes wrong. And if nothing goes wrong when your tenant moves in, that's great. You're doing a good job. Good stuff. All right. We have a nice one today. So our guest today, a referral from uh, Nikki DeLeon. Nikki, Nikki and RJ were originally episode 43. That's like two years ago, Mark. Oof. Uh, but our guest today, Chicago-based uh, professional house hacker and out-of-state real estate investor. Uh, the portfolio includes single families, a small multifamily. She's in five different markets. 
She's dabbled in a variety of investing strategies, including the house hack, medium-term rentals. She's bird. She's done 1031 exchange, has no signs of stopping now. She's also one of the co-founders of the Chicago chapter of Real Estate Invest Her, uh, which we will link to in the show notes for, for all the female listeners out there. And without further ado, Corey, oh, Corey I, almost, I almost messed it up. Corey <laughs> Dieter, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm just super excited to be here. It's been a an interesting summer, which I'll get into. And I feel like um, the stars have aligned for me to just continue to share my story and um, encourage listeners to um, try new things and um, really just take risks when it comes to um, enhancing your world and growing your real estate portfolio. And I think that sounds awesome to all our listeners. So let's, let's dive in here. So I, the real estate journey started, I believe, with a house hack in Andersonville. So yes. let's start there with, you know, what, what gave you the bug and then why a house hack and why Andersonville? Yeah, um, sure. So I rented in Chicago. I originally, after grad school, I moved back to Chicago and um, lived in Rogers Park, Park for a couple of years and then just really loved Andersonville. Um, my husband was working in the city of Evanston, um, like in the local government. And so he was adamant about not having a terrible commute. And so Andersonville to me was like the coolest, most Northern neighborhood in Chicago. And um, so we rented for a few years and we were huge Susie Orman fans. And she was saying, you know, 20% down, eight months emergency fund. And so we were just very fiscally conservative. And um, we finally got to that point after renting in Andersonville for three years. And we were just walking around the neighborhood and saw a for sale sign and then an open house sign on a duplex that was literally three blocks away from where we lived. And so we walked through, loved the place. It wasn't as cute as the, the rental that we were living in. Our apartment had been recently renovated. And so it would have been like slightly a... Uh, a step back just in terms of comfort level, but the location was great and the ability to own um, was really appealing to us. And the other thing that was really attractive about this property is that it had one unit that was vacant and one unit that was already rented. Um, and so I think it was being rented for $1,400 a month when we took over. Um, our rent at the time was, I think, $1,800 a month for a two bed, um, one bath. And so by moving in, we were able to reduce our housing expense by about like $300 a month. So it wasn't anything crazy, but um, over the course of our ownership, which it's been about six years now, um, our rent is up to, our rent rate is $1,895. And um, so it's consistently increased. We have had zero vacancy. Um, this neighborhood is super popular and attractive to renters. And so we found amazing quality tenants who have, they've all become our friends over time. And so um, we've had amazing neighbors, um, really consistent rent payments, even through COVID. Um, and in a, maybe three years ago, we did um, a major renovation um, to our unit. So one of the things that really attracted me to this duplex in particular, it's a Victorian two flat, um, was it had a completely unfinished attic. And so I just loved the idea of bringing this house to its full potential. And so we ended up, um, and this is pre-COVID, we ended up um, basically finishing out that entire attic to be more of like a primary suite. So it has our bedroom up there. It's got a huge master bathroom that has what, uh, we're not tub bath people. And so um, it's got what's called the party shower. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we, I haven't tried fitting all these people in, but I'm sure it could fit like 15 people tightly. <laughs> so, um, and then it's got like a loft space up there, which originally was going to be an office space, but we just used it as like a separate lounge area for us. Um, and so even though when we first moved in, it was kind of a step back in terms of comfort level, it really gave us the opportunity to kind of get used to the property, see what we like, what we don't like. And then when we were able to get more cash, we were able to just finish it out the way that we wanted. Um, and then about, so this real was quick right to, when to, oh, yeah, So ahead. real quick to interject, you mentioned rents going up there, which is great, but yeah. if you don't mind sharing what was the purchase price and what do you think that thing's worth now? Or at least what, what do you think that yeah. spread is? Yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. That's the big one. So um, we just got a new home equity line of credit. So I know what the most recent appraisal is. So we bought for five sixty five. dollars um, Our renovation was major. Um, we had to get rid of a bedroom. We had to add interior stairs, which led to a complete kitchen renovation and then dormers and the whole shebang. Um, and so our renovation was just over 200 k 
Um, and so all in, we're at like, I would say 775 and our most recent appraisal, which was about two months ago, um, it's at 835 now. So um, I was just hoping for the day that our appraised value <laughs> was over what we've um, put all in. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we did it for our comfort and our personal, you know, our, our own choices. This to us was kind of like a potential forever home. Even if we don't live in this place forever, it's a it's a forever hold for us. And so um, we're finally over the hump where um, the house is worth more than we've put into it. And every year we've just taken on a new little project. And so um, as you can imagine, the contractors ruin the backyard with bringing all of the supplies and drywall in. I mean, the backyard was nothing to, to write home about anyways, but we have a dog. And so we ended up putting in like pet friendly turf, which is um, for any dog owners, it's, it's the greatest thing because they, ne she never comes in with muddy paws anymore. Um, and it's, it's low maintenance. And so, um, so yeah, so that was one of the projects that we did landscaping. We just kind of done little things, um, bit by bit, but when it comes to turning over the downstairs unit, um, it, it's been pretty easy. I think we painted the first time we had a turnover. We've had three turnovers. Um, the last one that we did, which was a little over a year ago, we literally could have taken the keys from the former tenant and handed them to the new tenant. Um, our tenant cleaned everything. The oven was clean. The fridge was wiped out. It was just in perfect condition. And during COVID, she was bored. Um, so she asked if she could paint the entire unit. And I was like, well, it depends on what color. And she was like, can I do edge comb gray? And I was like, Absolutely. You can. Um, so well, I think so six years ago though, you just made this house sound way too easy. And you have a lot of listeners that are, are saying, oh, it was six years ago, you know, I I didn't uh I, I was I'm too late and, and everything you just said just sounded really easy. So going back six years ago, I'm sure it wasn't. You're a planner, just from listen, if you listen to Susie Orman, you're a planner <laughs> and, and you 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 question everything you do and is and you're conservative in that sense, like. What was going through your mind at that time? What, what were the humps that you had to get over that maybe some of our listeners that are wanting to do what you did, what, what are some of those hurdles that, that, are, that, yeah. that are getting in their way? Yeah. So we believed strongly in the neighborhood and the appreciation value. Um, we had been renting in the area. So we were very familiar with the neighborhood. Um, I was in all the Facebook groups. And so I, I was able to get the vibe of the neighborhood and what the community was like what people were looking for in terms of their housing. Um, and so I, I knew that if we bought this thing, um, one, the monthly payment, our portion of the monthly payment was going down, um, which allowed us to save more for reserves. We had um, a really solid home inspection report. So um, the inspector said, you know, this, this thing is built solid, like they don't make them like this anymore. And so I think we just felt really comfortable with the property that we were finding. And so at the time it was a little bit of a higher purchase price. And if you ask my friends who live in the suburbs that have 4,000 square foot homes for less than what we were buying, you know, they would, they would say we're crazy, but, um, we, you know, we also knew that we didn't want to have kids. And so it's not like we were going to have to like expand and get pushed out of our own home. We were going to be comfortable for a really long time. So I would say my advice to anybody that is looking to house hack is find a, find an area that you truly believe in where the numbers make sense. You're seeing new restaurants come in or just new commerce in general. So even if it's, on, if it's in the suburbs, like, are you seeing um, a top golf getting built, you know, around the block or like, you know, what are the types of attractions that are going to continue to make this community great, you know, and um, are the schools, you know, popular or are people, you know, criticizing the schools and just, I, I feel like if you're an active community member, um, you will find out everything that you need to know about whether or not that is a place that is worth investing in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on the community part, right? Like the, the areas I play well in, I know, right? Like we, we know what's going on. And when we try to stretch that, that's usually when, when the project doesn't turn out great. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So we, we get this house hack and now there's, there's a jump now to out-of-state investing. Mm -hmm. so, so let's talk about just the mindset there. If you can give just a quick one minute, Hey, this real estate thing is good. I like it. However, yep. I'm going to look out of state. So what, what, yeah. what was that thought process? And, and, yep. and talk us through that before we start jumping into those processes. Or yeah. And I mean, that's like, that's the antithesis of being a community member, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And, and some of these places I had never stepped foot in before, like not even on a family vacation. And so, um, what was happening at the time? So this was, 
Right. This was like 2016, 2017. So shortly after we purchased our place and um, I was in a terrible job. Um, I was reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I was reading Four Hour Work Week. I was reading How Will You Measure Your Life? Like all of these existential books that were um, like just making me feel terrible about going to work every single day. And, and the place that I was working, it was like super old school. Like I had to wear pantyhose. Like it was just, ugh, you know? And so, um, also at the time, my brother, uh, who had lifelong illness, he was in hospice. So he was in hospice for two to three years. And so I think a combination of being in a, and I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but I was in a shitty job watching somebody that I loved die you know, that didn't have the physical ability to enjoy their life anymore. To me, that was like, oh my God, what am I doing? How do I get out of this situation? And I remember asking my husband like every day after work, like how much is in our checking account? Can I quit today? And the answer was always no. <laughs> and so, um, so I got to the point where, you know, I said, we have to find a way to like invest and and get become less dependent on um, our W-2s, even if we liked working. And so at the time, um, I found a new job. So that was step one um, that was a little bit more money. It was remote. So, you know, six years ago, five years ago, um, there weren't a lot of remote jobs, but I was able to find one and, and traveling is a huge passion of mine as well. And so that was great. Um, and then the other thing was um, I was listening to Bigger Pockets, and there was another podcast called uh, Real Estate Rookie um, that was a husband and wife couple back, you know, a long time ago. And so those two podcasts got me into investing in general, but there were uh, two guests on each of those podcasts that made a huge difference in terms of my ability to do even conceive of um, out of state investing. One was uh, David Green. <laughs> So I, we we go ahead and plug the book. That's (laughs) yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's the book on out of state investing. Um, and he was still working his W2 as a cop at the time. And I remember listening to that episode two or three times and I just taking notes on like all of the different steps. And so, um, that was one of them. And then the other guest on real estate rookie, her name was Jennifer Beatles. And she was um, a Seattle based agent and had been investing in Seattle for a really long time, got priced out of that market, and she started investing out of state. And so she talked about what are the different economic factors that make um, a market really attractive for investing, you know, things like population growth, diversity of employers. uh, low unemployment rate, like good um, rent to purchase price ratios, um, low crime. And so um, so I think like using her insight in terms of like which market, how to tell what a good market is. And she listed off like three markets in the podcast. And I, and one of them that she mentioned was Indianapolis. And I was like, oh, that's three hours for me. Like that, that sounds like a good place to start. So I paired that information with David Green's um, uh, approach of, call a bunch of agent offices and ask for, ask to talk to some of the agents that are investors themselves and just interview that way. And so we found one that we loved. Um, he was born and raised in Indianapolis, spent six hours driving us around all of the different market, um, the different neighborhoods, and eventually went on under contract on two properties within the following month and closed on both of them in the same day. So we bought a triplex and a duplex on the same day, about a month later. Um, and so that was the, so those, so let's talk about those for a second. So we, we go and we make these, it sounds like they're probably light value add or turnkey ish, right? Like we're not jumping into some, some sort of gut situation Yeah, going, going through the process again, I'm sure they, they've ended up well, but what are some things you would have changed? Yeah. Um, so I would, the biggest, the biggest thing that I have learned, um, over purchasing those properties as well as many others is, um, depending on the class of the property, um, the variance between your pro forma versus your actual performance will vary. And everybody has a certain threshold of tolerance for that variance. And so, my, um, what I've learned across the years is I hate variance, <laughs> which <laughs> means over the last few years, I've been, um, looking at which properties are still serving us, which ones are amazing for 1031 exchange opportunities. And I've slowly been upgrading the class of property that I'm investing in to something that I feel more comfortable with, 
Now we have used property managers for a majority of our out-of-state rentals. Um, I have one uh, duplex in um, this tiny town just north of Milwaukee called Shorewood that is, it's an A neighborhood. I feel very comfortable managing and nothing goes wrong there. Um, and they're just, our tenants like landscape and garden for us. Like that's how much they love the property and have pride of uh, pride of rentership, I guess. Um, but I think for the properties that, and I know some people have done super well with C-class properties. It's just, I haven't been able to figure that out myself. And so I, um, I think I would have, looking back, I would have not been afraid to do burrs from the beginning. Um, just investing more in the relationships in those markets to do them. And I would have done, I would have found value add opportunities in better neighborhoods than I was um, originally looking for. Got it. Obviously, though, it's been successful. You're now in five different markets after you jumped into Indy. So you kept looking, kept rerunning the same, call it, processes. Mm-hmm. Can Let's get a little tactical here. How So many people think about this. So they look at it and, and they maybe even go meet with an agent and then you know drive around one weekend but never pull the trigger. What has to happen to put this all in place? Like If you were writing like the 101 here on like how to make this something that's repeatable across multiple markets, what is the high-level cliff notes you would share with the listeners? Yeah. I think the first one would be to not get, not be afraid of getting started. Um, I think there's a lot of people that do the steps and they get like right on the edge and then something talks them out of it. Um, And one thing that I have never really struggled with, I would say is just getting over that hump. So like, you know, an example, when I was younger, I was super, super shy. And so what I did was I found a job as a server because it forced me to talk to people. Um, when I was in New Zealand on spring break one year, when I was, I was studying abroad in Australia, we went to New Zealand and there was like this Canyon swing where you, um, basically it's kind of like bungee jumping, but you swing at the bottom and they said, you can either run off, you can get pushed off. You can, we can put you in a chair and we can push the chair off. And I was like, let me just run off. And so I've, I've never been afraid to like face my fear. And it's kind of one of those things that like commit and then figure it out. Um, And so one thing that I would, uh, and I know not everybody's wired that way, but one thing that I would remind people is just because you're under contract, um, that, that can be a very scary time. But as long as you have an inspection period, use that to your advantage, like run the numbers, like talk to your insurance agent. Um, there's a lot that you can do even before you order an inspection. Um, so one of the properties that um, I'm breaking contract with today was um, a value add opportunity. It's a duplex in Chattanooga um, that has the opportunity to build out a third unit. Well, I made the assumption that this would take 75 grand. I have two soft bids from contractors, two separate contractors, and they're like, this is gonna be like close to 200. So you know, make your assumptions known to yourself, to your spouse, to your partner, like whoever, and then just pressure test those assumptions. And if you can't talk yourself out of it after you pressure test those assumptions, just get into it. And I mean, you know, we can talk about some of the failures that I've had in real estate, but even my failures have made me money. Like we have not lost money on real estate yet. And so it's a very forgiving um, investment strategy. And I think not only can you grow financially, but I think you grow as a person by putting yourself in this uncomfortable situation and just figuring it out. That's so good. The last two minutes there are so good of just, uh, I would rewind that of just real estate is so, it it is so forgiving, especially when you're not doing the, especially when you're not flipping, when you're doing the long-term hold, you have so much on your side there. Yep. Well, let's bring something up though here, because I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, because you've had 2015, 16, you know, you've had the, 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 your tailwinds with you. Anyone that started investing in the last 10 years has, it's been a downhill, uh, kind of, uh, you know, rents have, rents have gone up more, uh, in in the last couple of years than uh, they have the last 20 years for the most part. So like, talk to me about what preparing for your portfolio or future buying in, in a time that eventually, you know, whether it be a year from now or five years or now, things are going to change and you'll have, uh, you'll be, uh, going against the wind, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I'm nervous about that I'm trying to work through. Um, so one of the things that I'm a little bit nervous about is, um, since I left my W2, I don't have access to conventional loans anymore. Um, and you know, with interest rates so high, I think just trying to find access to cheap money is something that everybody's going to be, um, challenged with. And one of the things that I keep, replaying in my mind is that you, and my lender actually told me this, he said, 
uh, date the loan, marry the house. Um, and so you can always refinance when interest rates go down. Um, and if the numbers make sense with the rates as high as they are, whether it's a conventional loan or DSCR loan, or I'm using a lot of commercial loans because the rates on my commercial loans have been cheaper than um, conventional. Um, but if the numbers make sense now, and you might have to underwrite like a lot more properties in order to find those deals, but you know, um, I just went under contract for a, a townhome that I'm going to do a medium term rental in, um, in Tennessee and list price. I was able to get under contract for $60,000 below actually $67,000. Uh, it, it was listed for 350 and I'm under contract for 292. Six months ago, that was not possible anywhere. And, you know, there were multiple offers. I was, you know, I was making offers in Salt Lake City and everything was going 50 above asking all cash. And so there, every market's going to have different challenges. Um, and, and I think we've seen it from six months ago to now, but I think you just have to educate yourself. Um, and that's a lot through like understanding the real estate community, making connections to whether it's to lenders, to agents, um, just to prepare yourself for the different varieties of challenges that you're going to face. And for those of us that are in it for the long haul, these are just, um, these are just weapons in our, you know, these are just like tools in our toolkit that will be able, it's, the market is cyclical. And so this is going to happen again. And so I think the better, um, the better we, the better experience that we get now and the more that we learn, and the more that we're open to learning instead of saying, I can't do this, or um, the interest rates are too high, the more that you figure out, like, how can I find a better loan or how can I make this deal work, whether it's um, changing your strategy. So um, this this townhome that I'm under contract in, it barely cash flows if I do a long-term rental. However, if I do a medium-term rental and turn it into executive housing or travel nurse housing, it cash flows almost $1,000 a month. And so I think it's just trying to figure out which strategy is appropriate for what time. Talk to us about the transfer from W-2 to uh, self-employed. I'm not sure in that if your husband still has W-2, but there's always a lot of hiccups. Like what challenges did you face? Is there anything from that that leap that you made you do differently uh, that, that yeah. you did? Yeah. Um, so my husband has had real estate professional status since 2019. Um, so he was also in a soul crushing job and left. And at the time we were like, well, you can either find another job or you can do real estate um, full time. And man, we, you know, we had a decent amount of property at the time. Um, so um, we talked to, a, and this was the first time that we were having conversations with the CPA. We had previously done TurboTax. And so before my husband left his job, uh, we asked, you know, what would real estate professional status do for us in terms of our tax liability? And uh, she ran the numbers and she said, uh, he, you guys would actually, um, your tax refund would be more than what your husband would net um, if he worked the remainder of this year. So we said, okay, well, so for at least this year, it actually pays to, for him not to go back to work instead of going back to work. And so that was a no brainer. And then, um, you know, he just had a lot of fun doing that. And so he just kept, he kept on that role. Um, I was the higher W2 um income earner. And so it took a lot more for me to leave. And I still kind of position what I'm doing as a sabbatical. Like I, um, cause it, it's like hedging against the failure, right? Like I, if I say it's a sabbatical, then I can always go back. And it wasn't that I had to go back to work, you know? So, um, so when I left, um, this was in May, um, I was working for a, a startup, early stage startup, as you can imagine, super stressful, um, many nights where I was working till three in the morning. Um, and because it's a small company, you just don't have the luxury of having all of these departments to do all of this stuff for you. So I was the HR department. I was the finance department. I was the accounting department. I was, um, you know, working with our insurance agents. And so it was just a lot of hats and I kind of felt like everybody's mom. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like I'm just getting tugged in all these different directions. And my personality is that like, I want to check all of the boxes before I go to bed every single night. And what I realized is they will never all be checked. Um, and so there was a lot of dissatisfaction at the end of every single day. I was stressed out. Um, my, I, for the first time I had to go on high blood pressure medication. Um, I broke a tooth because my TMJ and my teeth grinding was so bad in the middle of the night. Oh, and so I was like, I've got to stop this. And so, um, Luckily, from the financial perspective, what my husband and I did, and we're not like Susie at like Susie people anymore, but like there's a lot that just kind of sticks with you. But one of the things that, and I've picked up a little bit of Dave Ramsey, but 
just a little bit. Um, but he, uh, one of the things that he talks about is like sinking funds. And so what I ended up doing was saying, okay, like for all of our known fixed expenses for the year, so that's our mortgage, our utilities, our cell phone bill, our insurance, all of those different things that we know what they're going to cost. Like, let's just try and pre-fund that account for the year as much as possible. So the first thing I did was max out my 401k and we live very below our means because of the house hack. And we've actually house hacked our guest room for travel nurses as well. And so we, when that room is occupied, we um, we're making $600 a month on our mortgage now, but First thing I did was uh, totally fund my 401k. And then the second thing that I did was I said, okay, like we know that our fixed expenses are a certain number and it's, it's about, I think it's like 80 grand. Um, let's just aggressively put $80,000 into this account as quickly as possible. And so I think we funded that by April or May. Um, so I think having that money in the bank to just be like, guys, I'm done. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm cranky. I'm out of here. Um, was, was enough for me to just have the boost and, um, uh, at least to take a summer sabbatical. And I think, um, for the field that I'm in, so I'm in health tech, um, it's still, the job market is still very good. So I can find a job if I want to, and I'm just really hoping that I don't have to go back. And so when I left, um, you know, I was pretty detail oriented when it came to like my transition plan at my, at my company. And they were like, this is a lot. <laughs> and there's a lot that you do that nobody knows how to do. Um, and so, uh, they offered to, um, give me a contracting role, a contractor role. And so I do about 10 hours a month, um, for my former employer. And so, uh, the conditions of that were, I have one basically one point of contact that I work with. So I'm no longer being attacked by a lot of people that need a lot of things for me. And because it's only 10 hours a month, people are really mindful of what they're asking me to do because it's the stuff that nobody else can do. And it's the stuff that I enjoy doing. And so I still have my toes dipped in this company. Um, there's still an open door for potentially going back part-time. Um, but then I think there's also open doors for me to do contract roles or really anything um, full-time or contractor on a full-time or contract basis um, with a bunch of different employers. So I actually just talked to um, a friend of mine who started a kind of like a, a end of life celebration company. So like the, the funeral alternative. And because I was, uh, you know, my, my brother's experience just really resonated with me and I've become a hospice volunteer. Um, so now I'm considering doing end of life ceremony, facilitating those end of life ceremonies. And so there's been a lot of opportunities that have come because that, that will give me money <laughs> that have come because I've cut out this thing that was like 80 hours a week of work. Um, and so, and even just within the real estate space too. So, you know, being able to sell some properties, to buy new properties, to have the time to convert some things into uh, medium-term rentals, which I would have just never had the time to do before, um, has been wonderful this summer. I love that. I told somebody the other day that their job is uh, the biggest opportunity cost that they have right now. Like yeah. <laughs> They need to get out now. Yeah. I, I want to bring something up you said there about the sabbatical. And, and Tom, I think you did something similar. And I, I know I did. Heck, it's been uh, 18 years now. I knew uh, trucking was the only, tra transportation, the only other thing I ever did before real estate. And I knew that, all right, I was young too. So I was making 60 grand. So it's like worst case scenario, I could always go find a 60 grand job uh, at trucking if I strike out here. Like, so I always had that backup plan and that always made me feel confident. But I also knew I never wanted to go back and work for a trucking company. So that was the motive. It was the motivator and uh, in two different ways. Uh, so I know, I know, Tom, you went through similar uh, and you had, you're making a lot more in yours. So you had a bunch more to consider that. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I almost held on to, I don't want to say too long, but like I was in a position where it was, it was easier. Like the scary part was gone because I was double dipping with real estate and the W2 for so long. Yeah. Right. So I, I mean, in retrospect, it's like once, once it was done, it's like, oh, I should have done this three years ago. But it's like, well, maybe that was the right time to do it though. Well, right? uh, when, when I'm getting slapped with uh, paying my own healthcare every month. It's like, all right, yeah, maybe it was good that I had this for a while. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I held on too long, but I held on too long also because I was waiting for the, the financing for my new house that I was going to move mm -hmm. into. So I was literally just waiting. Like I literally just started calling off work like two weeks before uh, the, the loan was going to be done. And I'm like, they can't fire me that fast. So, uh -huh. uh, but yeah, that was uh, along those lines. So Corey, like what about the financing piece? Like how, how is, how, it doesn't sound like it's affected you too much. Like what, how did that strategy have to change for you going from conventional yeah. to commercial? 
Yeah. So I had been doing commercial loans um, for a couple of years beforehand. Um, and um, I use U.S. Bank. I have a really great relationship with my lender there. Um, and they essentially, you know, will do a 20 percent or 80 percent LTV um, for the last loan that I closed on last week was 5.15 percent. Um, five year loan, 25 year AM. And so those terms are better than what I'm seeing on um, the conventional residential side. The only thing that I'm just like really annoyed at is uh, my husband and I love to ski and we wanted to buy a house in Salt Lake City that we could convert to a, you know, medium rental or Airbnb, a short-term rental property for the time that we're not using and then have access to it for a couple months a year. Um, so that one has been a little, we're trying to figure out like, how do we do that? And I'm kind of toying with, I've done a little bit of research of uh, about like 1031 exchanging into that property and then converting into a primary to get out of the 1031 obligation. And so there's that one's been a little bit tricky. Um, so I would say like if you have plans to move uh, for your primary, that one that one might be a little bit difficult. But I do think that there's a lot of um, landlords that are just getting tired of being a landlord. And so seller I've even seen in listings uh, where, you know, agents are mentioning seller financing available. And so just a lot more than I have in the past. And so I think seller financing is an option. Um, we've used a uh, certain lending for DSCR loans. The rates are a little bit higher, but I think, you know, if you can find a, a killer deal, um, that can still work. And so DSCR and commercial loans have been wonderful. And luckily, like our personal financial statement at this point is healthy enough to, um, uh, for at least for our commercial lender to be comfortable with it. Um, the only we've, we've gotten tripped up with, um, liquidity requirements for the DSCR loans where all, we're not liquid because anytime we have liquidity, we're investing it into a rehab or something like that. And so, um, that's been a little bit tricky to figure out, but, um, so far it has not stopped me. And I think this is one of those things that you just network, go to meetups, listen to podcasts, like the money is out there. You just have to find it. Couldn't agree more, especially once you get into this commercial space. There's so many little credit banks. There's so many Renovos of the world. Like, there's so many different ways that people look at this once you're outside Freddie and Fannie. Yeah. Right. I guess let me phrase it another way. The variance between them is higher. Mm -hmm. It's less commoditized. There's a lot of people out there, and each one brings their own thing to the table. And then yeah. that can fit with your needs. So I've actually the US bank product you've talked about, I've used that before. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually, where I didn't like it was when I was doing rehabs and they were, they were requiring six months of seasoning, right? Oh. So like it fits, it fits perfect for like what you're doing and it fits per few things I bought. And then I went to go do that and that, you know, I can't add six months of holding costs. Yeah. So they're not the right, they're not the right tool for that one. Yeah. But again, like everyone has their own little ins and outs of what, what makes the most yeah. sense. You, it, it's on you as the investor to go find it. Yeah. There's hundreds yeah. of them. It's, it's on you. And I think if you have the ability to get a home equity line of credit, just be super aggressive with what you're asking for. So at this point, we have two. We have one with Bank of America that is principal and interest payments, but it's got a lower interest rate. And then we've got one with Alliant Credit Union, which has a high, slightly higher interest rate, but it's interest only payments. And that one has like a double the limit of the other one. And so we've got about 600K of liquidity um, that we can use to, to do the purchase. And then uh, we basically go to um, our US bank lender for um, the refinance. And it has not been um, an issue. We've, we've refinanced within one month of purchasing. So um, it's been the seasoning has not been an issue for us, um, but we also haven't done any like major renovations on, on the projects that we've used US Bank for. Got it. That's awesome. So, so what's the future? Like five years from now, 10 years from now, is it just keep gobbling up, you know, a home here, a town home here, a, a small multi here? Is it just, you know, keep going? Or is there, is there something else on the horizon? What, what's the next five years? Yeah. Um, so what I'm excited about is um, the opportunity to explore partnerships. And so partnerships was one of those things that I had been approached um, about, you know, a from a few people um, over the past couple of years. But because I was working, I was like, I'm not gonna be able to dedicate the time and attention. Um, and I had real reservations for using somebody's capital and not really being, you know, a, a good uh, custodian of those, you know, of those funds. And so now that I'm not working and I have the time, I can really explore different types of partnerships or different types of uh, arrangements that might make sense. And so 
I have not also done any short-term rentals in the past. And so now that I have some time, um, I am a systems and process person. And so I think the idea of um, learning price labs and like automating messages and, you know, just figuring out all of those different things to really make short-term rentals hum is very exciting to me. And so uh, reaching out to my friends and family to say, where have you always wanted a vacation home? And uh, is that something that I could help you with and do all of the work for you? And um, a lot of people that buy these second homes, you know, without the investor hat on, they're just saying, you know, if I can rent it enough to like cover the cake payment, I would be thrilled. And to be able to say, well, wouldn't it be great if you could actually cash flow from it as well? Like, let me help you actually make money from this instead. Um, that's been a really exciting conversation to have with folks. Um, same thing with medium term rentals. And so um, I am not of the mindset that, you know, the biggest portfolio, the largest number of units is the best. I'm actually trying to figure out, like, how can I have the smallest uh, portfolio with the largest cash flow. And so I have not, um, I have not replaced my W2 income yet. And I, and I don't necessarily need to, because we are living, you know, we're living well below my means. Um, but I think just having the room to explore some of these more upfront time in intensive, um, investment opportunities and have access to more capital through partnerships and really bring people along my journey. So, um, I think a lot of investors are in the same boat where you don't necessarily have a ton of friends and family that are doing this alongside you. You make, uh, you make friends within the real estate community. And so to be able to bring people from my personal life that would never even think of doing investing and to enhance their lives and for it to be a win-win. I think that's, that's the other beauty of um, real estate investing is it is not zero sum. Um, everybody can win in this process. Um, I just think like, that's the joy and the goodness that I'm really excited about bringing into my life instead of, you know, the, the slaving and the um, just being cranky and tired and breaking more teeth and taking more pills. So, um, Which so yeah, awesome. that's, that's on the horizon. I also grind my teeth. So <laughs> I'm in that same boat as you have. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So th that's awesome. What, one more before we wrap here, yeah. I mentioned during the intro invest her. Yeah. So I, I know, I think Nikki mentioned when she's been on the show, but for our listeners who don't know, here, give us the, you know, one minute overview and then we'll obviously link to it in the show notes here. Yeah. Yeah. So Invest Her was started by Andresa Guidelli and um, Liz Faircloth. They're both kind of in the Philly area um, and they have a podcast of their own that is excellent. And that's kind of how I found about, I found out about that group. Real quick, um, is that Matt Faircloth's wife then? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Small. I did not know that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so um, they actually just had their first in-person conference um, this past June, which to me was like the kickoff of my sabbatical. Um, and so it was uh, an amazing all-female conference. And um, But they have a lot of different, so they've got their own like mastermind group. They have the podcast. They have um, a book, a publishing company as well. And they were just, they recently just merged with bigger pockets. And so there's there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of support that you can get through that group. And in addition to all of that, they have local chapters in many different markets. And I think they're outside of the US as well at this point. Um, and so, so we meet once a month. Um, we were virtual during COVID, but now we're getting back to meeting in person um, at Chief O'Neill's. And I think it's the first Wednesday of every single month. Um, very casual. We don't usually do a lot of like content and info sharing just because we find that that's, a, that's everywhere. Um, and selfishly, the, the co-hosts of mine, we were just like, we just want people to hang out with that are doing this because none of our friends and family are talking real estate. And, you know, we're sick of just being on Zooms all day. And so um, it's mostly just a place for fellowship and um, finding contacts and resources within the Chicago market that can help us go to the next level. That's great. Great stuff. We'll link to in the show notes. Uh, if anyone's interested, we can get you in contact with Corey. Um, I, we've been the, I, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but we do have it on our link in the resources for when the, when the meetups are. Awesome. Mark, we good to wrap? We are ready to wrap. Let's wrap. You ready, Corey? Yep. All right. What's your competitive advantage? There's lots of people that, that uh, hear you on this and would love to be in your situation. How have you been able to do this while others wish they could? Um, ooh, so this one is a little, so I'm not, I'm not the, it's not that I don't know how to phrase it the right way, but I am really good at judging whether or not to spend a long time on a decision or a short time on a decision and making the decision in the, giving the decision, the amount of gravity and weight that it needs in order to move forward. That's All right. All right. I'll take it. Mark and I just make quick decisions. I don't know if that's good <laughs> or bad. It helps. And 
I don't, I don't fluctuate like that. I've learned to slow down because my husband needs me to slow down. Otherwise I'll go crazy. (laughs) So I'll change this one up a little bit. What is one piece of advice you would tell someone that is looking to buy their first property in a market that they don't live in? Ooh, um, uh, make good connections with agents, um, in that market. I dig it. What do you do for fun? Ooh, um, I love to ski. That's probably like one of my biggest passions. So we can't do it that much in Chicago, but, um, for the last two or three winters, we've gotten an Airbnb for like a extended, you know, like month long period of time and, um, enjoyed skiing. What's a good book podcast or self-development activity you would recommend to our listeners? Um, gosh, (laughs) I read so many. Um, I would say like, Whatever you're ready to receive, I, there's like a Buddhist quote that says like um, the the student will or the teacher will appear when the student is ready. And so I think just ask yourself like what kind of content and development do you need, and just seek that out. Because um, I've read a lot of books that just, it just wasn't the right time, and I didn't get a lot from them. But then you know two years later I revisit it and I'm like oh my gosh, this, there's like so many nuggets that I didn't pick up. And so don't be afraid to read a book you know a second time, and then also just figure out like what do you actually need at the time and pursue that. She said nuggets. We, we got feedback. We, we, used bring- say, we used to say nuggets too much and we haven't said it in a really long time. And, and you just nuggets, said it. nuggets, nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> we had feedback and I, we've been cutting back on awesome as well. That's one. Uh, awesome and, and, and nuggets are the two things that we said were too, too much. <laughs> actually, listeners, if you want to send any more feedback, we'll listen to it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we actually like the nuggets continue. are awesome. <laughs> we, we prefer the positive ones versus the bus and chops, but we'll take both. So, <laughs> you know, I went to, uh, after I think the awesome conversation we had, I went to my, my 12 year old awesome, daughter. Man. And I asked her, I said, I just want to make sure, like, you guys still say awesome, right? Like, she's, and she's like, oh, yeah, we well, say it all the time. All right, good. Like, it's not a generational thing. So <laughs> I had to clarify that. All right. Besides yourself, name one person in your local network you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Chicago. Oh, um, I would say Jennifer Beatles. Um, so that podcast guest that I had listened to, she has, she has changed my entire real estate trajectory, just based on the content and the generosity that she has just in terms of like sharing her network. And, um, so her website is addicted to ROI. Um, but I've, I've found at least five deals that I've purchased, um, through her network of investor friendly agents. Um, and I've made really good friends with a lot of people in that community. And Jennifer, um, has turned into what I call a friend tour. (laughs) So, uh, definitely a mentor definitely puts me in my place. Definitely challenging, challenges me to think bigger, but she's also super supportive and just has been very encouraging in my journey and reminds me not to be too hard on myself when I think I'm a failure. Corey, awesome. Great episode. You've provided so much to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Um, so, uh, just, I think, you know, join our community a real estate investor. If you're female, I think, um, I'm always looking for people to talk to about real estate. Um, I just, it's, it's such a fun topic to me and I love learning about new strategies. So I think, um, if you have a new strategy that you've tried, um, I'd love to hear about it. Um, my Instagram is Corey, uh, K O R underscore R E I. Um, so it's a play on my, ah. first one, so. <laughs> uh, so feel free to follow me there. It's a lot of pictures of travel and my dog and also sometimes real estate. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. All right, Mark, are you ready for the fact? Who are we playing for? Yes. Um, Deidre Daniels bought a t-shirt from, uh, Lincoln, Lincolnshire. So I thought I said Lincoln, what? Lincolnshire. So she bought a t-shirt. Thank you, Deidre. And now you have the opportunity to get a $50 gift card if we get this question right. I think we should expand it if it's me or Corey that gets it right. So yeah, it's multiple them. choice. It gives them a 50 50 shot. Yeah. So, Corey, you can't change, you can't take the same answer as Mark. You got to diversify. Okay. Just Reno- to Renovo is sponsoring it. So it doesn't matter. Like we will just give it away. Right. Right. No, <laughs> yeah. joking. Side, side note on all this, too. We, my, um, I actually knew one of the persons who bought a shirt, Tim Slanka. Shout out for that. We had it, I don't know two or three episodes ago. And then we sent him the gift card. And he's like, Hey man, is this fake? What's going on here? <laughs> it's like, no, we really send them up. <laughs> so, all right. So most of you listeners know Brookfield Zoo is open 365 days a year. COVID shut it down for about four months, by far the longest the zoo was ever closed, including that stretch. How many incidents in history have closed the Brookfield Zoo? So basically how many times has it been shut down 
It opened in, I don't know, 1930-something. Your multiple choice options, Mark, are two, five, nine, or 13. I'm going to say two. I'm going to say 9-11 and uh, COVID. Corey? I was going to say two also, so I forgot all of the other options. <laughs> so what are the... <laughs> two, five, nine, or 13. Oh, okay. Um, I'll go... Ooh, um, I'll go five then. Corey okay, with the save here. It's five. Oh, really? So okay. it, September 11th wasn't on there. It's it's all been weather re- related, like uh, freezing. So 2008 rainstorm, I don't remember that. 2011 blizzard, I can remember that. 2013 rainstorm, I don't remember. And then 2019 freezing temps. I, we all that was two, mm-hmm. right before COVID. You remember that one? Oh man, that was like Wednesday, Thursday during the middle of the week when it was like 20 below. I figured it was, all, it was all temperature related. It wasn't. Uh, yeah. Because it's not like you can turn the animals off. Like that's what I was saying. Like, like no one's welcome in, but it's not like the animals get to like, like uh, not come to work that day or whatever. Like they're all still there. Like that's the only way I was thinking too. It's funny. I like right. that it's only been closed five times in like a hundred years. I'm like, why, why would it ever be closed? The animals are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's It's a very Chicago attitude. Um, all right, Corey. Awesome show, Tom. Thanks. Uh, as always. Awesome show. Um, Listeners, check out, we talked about a couple of cool resources here today. One in the intro, we were, me and Tom were talking about uh, closing costs and all that. We'll link to that, but we also have an article on straightupchicagoinvestor.com blog. And then Investor, uh, Corey talked about Investor, uh, female investors out there. We don't have our fair share of investors on here. So I, I know that you got the listeners out there. So we, anyone that has any other awesome female investors, we want to get you on here as well too. So but uh, check out our website on underneath meetups and you'll see all the information on the local Chicago chapter for investor. So Corey, thank you very much. Tom, thank you. Listeners, we'll see you next week. Thanks all. Thanks.